There's a, there's a number of things I want to talk to you about, but let's start with the beginning. I know okay. that, that happened a, a bit into the podcast on Broken Brain, which I, I think is a great podcast, and I, I'm going to link to that in the show notes for, so people can get more of you. Thank you. Thank um, you. But let's talk a bit about kind of what forged the fires of you wanting to dive deeper into this space and of self-awareness and growth. Um, gosh, so many things. I think uh, the predominant catalyst is, is often the case for all of us is just our own trials and tribulations you know the adversity that we all face is uh i i feel the greatest catalyst for awakening and growth so i had my fair share of uh challenges to face from a very young age so um i don't know how far you want me to go back but um i'm just thinking about your parents specifically yeah yeah that's a pretty big one that was you know that's pretty significant for sure um i was an only child grew up in uh southeast uh england and the county of kent near the town of dover and if you're from Dover, you speak like this, mate. All right, I'm from Dover. <laughs> <laughs> so when people hear me over here, they do not think I'm from Dover. Um, and yeah, I had beautiful parents, but uh, sadly, my mum uh, had cancer from a very young age, and I was oblivious because I was like four or five years old. Um, and then I discovered, by virtue of the fact that she passed, that you know really what that meant. And as a seven-year-old, I still don't know to what degree I was able to process it probably not very well at all and uh, I think that lingered with me for a long time um, but then uh, I subsequently became very close to my dad uh, who was just as far as dads go I mean we're always biased but I think he was like the quintessential dad uh, he was playful he was loving he was incredibly affectionate I uh, never got hit um, I mean I was disciplined in the way that he would let me know what was right and wrong in life but um Anyway, so he and I became incredibly close. And, uh, and then sadly, when I was 17, he went to work one day and never came back because uh, he worked on the boats. We call them ferries in England where they went between Dover and, Eng- uh, Dover and um, Calais in France or Dover and Zeebrugge in Belgium. And at the time, it was sort of this major national disaster because hundreds of people died. The boats are sort of the size of a cruise liner. And um, uh, yeah, he was sadly one of the... Uh, the victims on it and uh so that was that was definitely an awakening to what life can bring us you know in a very harsh way uh, a rude awakening and um in ways that i don't think i understood at the time to your point it really forged who i became and i think more so than ever in the realm of patience love and compassion um that everybody is bearing their cross that oftentimes we're oblivious to uh and it's easy for people to judge people for their behaviors without knowing what they've been through and I feel very fortunate that I don't do that because I've been through a lot. And uh, if there's one superpower I have, I think it's really that complete non-judgment of people and accepting them for who they are. Well, I definitely want to find out how you got there because I think that's, <laughs> that's beautiful medicine to have. Yeah. Um, talk a bit about how the loss of your parents impacted you in life. You know, you brought up your first major relationship. Yeah. And in, in any other way that you felt that that has impacted you. Um, I think that was the main thing to begin with was the story of loss. And it's a very common narrative for humans, right? Like we go through a whole series of experiences being human, right? There's failure, then there's obviously on the flip side, there's victories and wins and success. But there's a whole gamut of experiences that we have. And loss is a very, it's a very big conversation. And um, so to begin with, whilst I was in the conversation of loss, and we'll get to why I'm phrasing it that way, um, I was just always scared of losing anything of value. And to begin with, it was really heightened through the experience of intimate love, right? Be- meeting this girl who I was incredibly drawn to and, in- and ended up uh, sort of being with for a while was a beautiful experience, sort of very quintessential. I saw across a crowded room, it couldn't have been more Hollywood, you know, and there's that <laughs> distinctive moment that is undeniable. And uh, sure enough, she reciprocated the feeling. We we got to meet a few days later and she confirmed that she felt the same way and that sort of sealed our fate and we started this beautiful relationship, which to begin with, like any relationship, was very much, um, there was this sort of harmony and symbiosis. And then eventually, as every relationship tends to do, each human goes into their own little patterns of survival. And so my pattern of survival was do everything I can to not lose her. Why? Because loss freaking hurts, Right. So I was the perfect boyfriend. Ironically, the behavioral adaptations I used to be a perfect boyfriend were not too dissimilar to who I was just being me, meaning generous and caring and thoughtful and loving. But it just had this sort of undercurrent, this subtext of fear, 
that she was not necessarily aware of, but she would have felt, right? We're energetic beings and we can feel that. So we got to a year and a half and two years and the relationship was always beautiful. Like we never fought. I'm not like one of these guys who gets angry and I've had beautiful relationships, fortunately. But she just one day decided she, you know, had to go. And I was very confused because we really had a beautiful relationship. And so she shared that um, the reason was, was because my love was suffocating. And um, that was kind of confusing because I was like, wait a minute, like a lot of love sounds like a good thing to me. But like when it dawned on me, I realized it was because it was a little bit inauthentic or a lot of bit inauthentic. The love was genuine, but it was sort of wrapped in this fear of loss. And so my adaptation to my own concerns was to be overly attentive to her, which on the surface looks good, but really it was a reflection of my own concerns, my own fear. And so that was that was probably the most pivotal moment in my evolution, in my awakening, because it led to this uh, this cathartic moment where there was a lot of crying and a lot of sadness to begin with when she first left, because I was sort of going through the process of shedding the skins of my own my own fears, my own ego. And then when I hit this moment uh, of, of realization, it was like nothing I'd ever experienced in my sort of at that point 29, 30 years of living which was that I was looking through this lens of inadequacy uh, and the ultimate fear of loss. And I realized at that moment that the questions I had incessantly running around in my head, like, where is she? Will she come back? Will I ever be with her again? Will I ever find love like that again? All of these sort of really kind of unanswerable questions, I got to the answer to all of them, which was three words, which is, I don't know. And, And I don't want to sort of in any way like, you know, belittle the response because it seems so simplistic but it for me it was like life altering because i realized at that moment not only was that the truth to all of the questions but it was also the nature of life itself which is uncertainty and there's a part of us as human beings that are very uncomfortable with uncertainty and that was the incessant dialogue and the narrative in my head that would keep me up at night which was always trying to figure out what's going to happen because it was looking for reassurance it was looking for some sort of stability and safety and in this case in the arms of somebody that i felt was the source of my love right and the comfort and so once i got that not only did i not know that's the truth to the answer of all those questions but then i got that it's also the nature of life at that moment i stopped trying to figure it out that's beautiful <laughs> It was so, total peace. So <laughs> talk about that process. I mean, it, it's not something that happens overnight. At this stage in your evolution or awakening, yeah. had you been introduced to Krishnamurti and these other great teachers or any of these great teachers at that point? I had, yeah. I'd, I'd done a little bit of sort of, quote unquote, spiritual research here and there. I'd actually at college, I had a friend of mine, Guy, who who's the sweetest, sweetest soul, and we're still in touch here and there through social media. But we would be these 18, 19-year-old punk kids, like, you know, and less of the punk because we were, we're pretty innocent. We were really boring, actually. And we would sit under a tree and talk about these big questions, like, why are we here? What's the meaning of life? And so I think that was really the introduction to me to these different topics of conversation that didn't involve drinking sports and women at that point in college, you know. And uh, I even recently found some notes of mine, you know, back then from college talking about the nature of consciousness, which was pretty crazy. Um so that led into some of these different texts from great teachers like Krishnamurti. But after that event, it really was, again, without sounding too sort of sci-fi-ish, it was a portal into a new dimension that I didn't even know existed, right? So I didn't know even to look for it. And, and that's why sometimes even describing my work to people can be um, a little bit uh, challenging because people are like, oh, what am I going to get from working with you? And I'm like, well, you won't know until you work with me. Because because <laughs> what you currently know is in a dimension that I'm not interested in. I'm interested in as much as I have compassion for it, but I want to take you to the world that is on the other side of your concerns. And so once I stepped into that realm, then it really opened the floodgates of all of these other incredible teachers out there from Krishnamurti to Ramana Maharshi to Srinivas Sagadatta, who are these like Indian gurus, traditional Indian gurus, all of whom had passed, you know, so unfortunately I can go and hang out and have some tea and shoot Couldn't the have shit. a pilgrimage, yeah. <laughs> all right. But, uh, but their words nonetheless resonated deeply with me and I read their books. But um, yeah, that just from that moment forth, it was kind of one of those, like, there's no turning back. You know, it's, uh, it, now it's just how far down the rabbit hole did I want to go. That's beautiful, brother. Well, right. you, you have, obviously, you, you're, you're writing a book right now. You have uh, 
a very successful personal coaching and mentorship program that you work with clients on on a lot of these topics from the subconscious to our mental game. Yeah. And and I think yeah. that just being introduced to you when I through through a friend who who sent me one of your podcasts, I was like, oh wow. And then I connected the dots with Heal and it just it just kind of blew my mind. And of course, you're for those that don't know, you're in the documentary Heal, which is fantastic. Yeah, and thank um, you. you're with some great company in that yeah. movie. Yeah. Um yeah, privileged to be with the like it was very humbling for me, like little kid from Dover, Kent. You know, all of a sudden I'm alongside the greats of like Joe Dispenza and Deepak Chopra and Bruce Lipton and it's uh, it, and I just want to give a shout out to Kelly Gores, who uh, she was the producer, you know, and 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 just what she did is incredible, and to include me, uh, and flatteringly so, because she said, you know, you have to be in the movie. You're the one of all these experts who's actually changed my life the most, you know. So wow. It was uh, it was a very humbling experience, and to see my mug up on the screen in Netflix, it's uh, yeah, it's fun, really fun. That's and the incredible. People's lives that have been touched by that. It's. Uh, very, I'm very grateful for that. So my question is, I mean, you you give a lot of examples of people have I've heard you speak before on the very direct way that you approach yeah. what people think are their problems. <laughs> and I appreciate that. I think the world needs it so much right now. Uh, yeah. But let's talk a little bit about the subconscious. You know, um, for people who are familiar with Bruce Lipton and Biology of Belief, and, and obviously, you know, Dr. Joe Dispenza was on Aubrey's podcast. A lot of my listeners listen to that show. Mm-hmm. They talk about this programming that we get mm-hmm. from the third trimester through the first seven years. And of course, we're still programmed after that. Yeah. How do you address things like that? Is that is that one of the ways in which you look through the lens on how to unpack programming with people? Or is it done completely differently where you cut right to the chase? A little bit of both. I think, you know, I love that you love the fact that I have that approach. And it's something that I really enjoy. And so many of my clients really appreciate because I think at the end of the day, like one of the quotes I use, I say, you're extraordinary. Be responsible for that shit. Right. And it's kind of appealing to the fact that you're an amazing human being, you know, everybody out there. And then we do have this woe is me narrative, which is part of what I would call your sort of inner child, your ego, your identity, your persona. And so, when I'm direct with people, it's sort of appealing. It's transcending these programs of inadequacy. And it's sort of awakening the being inside of you. It goes, you know what? I can actually handle this versus feeling like I'm a little child that needs somebody to model cuddle me. So um, so I'm glad that you, you appreciate that because it's fun, you know, and especially with some of my clients, like the results we get by virtue of the fact that I will literally tell them, like, I have zero tolerance to the way you're behaving right now. But they know I'm coming from such a loving place, right? And obviously, we've developed a, a history. I wouldn't say that out of the gates with someone I'm first meeting. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> actually, it does, re- <laughs> it does remind me of, I did that once, actually, and it almost didn't go well. I was in London this absolutely stunning sort of middle-aged woman, well-kept from a very well-to-do family. And I was working at this spa uh, slash golf club, which I love, Stoke Park Club in in London. And uh, she'd came up to see me and she'd been dating at the time a big rock star. And um, she did not stop talking for an hour and 20 minutes. Like I just listened, right? Like that's one of my superpowers for sure is just being present with people listening. She did not stop talking about everything that was going on in her life. And my words verbatim to her, my first response to her, as I said, that is so boring. (laughs) I mean, talk about a pattern interrupt, right? Because here's a beautiful woman who's been well catered to probably for at least the last decade of her life. And so for me to turn around and say that is so boring. And she literally, you know, you could see her go to get up. Like, who the hell is this guy? And I said, I want you to know why I just said that. And it was that you're extraordinary and you just told me 80 minutes of stuff that is so beneath you. And that's why it's so boring, right? And so that led into that, like the, the avenue that then she started to pursue, which is that she is way up beyond these stories of woe that she keeps telling all of her community members. Um, so anyway, so there's the tough love part, which I love and maybe we'll get into little discipline. Depends how well you behave. <laughs> um, but the subconscious part. So, you know, there is for sure, I like to look at, I like to use a lot of metaphors, right? So let's take a, um, we, technology these days is obviously something that most people are pretty well versed in. So if you walk into, say, a, an Apple store, you pick up a laptop, we know that it's going to be pre-installed with different pieces of software 
you know, which are obviously proprietary to Apple. They want to push their own products. So they're going to have iTunes. They're going to have iPhoto. They're going to have Safari. So these, to me, similarly in a human being, are these pre-installed codes, which are really there for our own survival, which at one level seems good, but they also become the complete barrier to our own freedom and living an extraordinary life. So that's the metaphor. And in our biology, you know, if we look at the deepest code, we have chromosomes, DNA, right? So I don't care how committed you are, how much willpower you are, you're not going to, I'm going to change the color of my eyes, <laughs> <laughs> right? That's pretty deep programming. So that's the, that's, that's everybody understands in our genetics, that's pretty much going to be the way it is. And then we could look at a much more superficial level. You walk into a coffee shop and you're like, you know, I think I'm going to get like a, a, a chai latte. And they're like, no, 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 you know what? I'm just going to get an Earl Grey tea. Right? That was a relatively easy piece of programming that you had some sort of domain over, that you've had a preference, maybe even a habit of getting the same drink, which has got a, a little bit of momentum associated with it, but you can do something about that. And so if they're these sort of the extremes, then closer to the genetic code is what I would call these subconscious constructs. And so when people come to me with their anxiety, their addiction, their depression, their issues with a relationship or not having a relationship, finances, not being able to lose weight, a lot of my athletes, you know, who know they've got a lot of potential that they're not quite accessing, these to me are the sort of the, the, the tier a little bit more towards the coffee choice, which is you're conscious of your problems. And they are just an access to me to reveal what is the construct you live within that has you think that way. So anxiety to me is not a problem. It's a symptom. But it does reveal who must you think you are and the way that you relate to your environment that makes you feel scared or makes you feel inadequate. And that, that's where we get the treasure. So sort of somewhere between your problems and your genetics is what I call that subconscious programming. It's very deep. It's like, you know, this house a beautiful home that only is the size it is by virtue of the foundation. If we had a thousand square foot foundation, I wouldn't be able to build this house because it can't hold it. So likewise, the subconscious constructs are foundational and they're born in these fundamental years of our childhood, but they create the context within which we get to play. So someone might metaphorically have aspirations for a 7,000 square foot home in their life, whatever that looks like, but their subconscious is designed for a 500 square foot studio apartment. <laughs> and then they run away, they keep knocking their head against the wall. And so until such time that we create space and we knock down those, those figurative walls that confine them, then you can't access the true aspirations that you have for yourself. And, and that's where I feel so much joy and privilege to be able to do that for people, to be able to help them see that what they're actually up against is their own programming. They're just oblivious to it, which is also compassion. Right? I say people can't be held accountable for that which they're oblivious to. And that goes back to the non-judgment. You know, if, if, if you don't know why you're doing something behaviorally that you may consciously know is bad for you, like smoking or drinking, but there's this impulsive pull to do it all the time, then to beat yourself up doesn't really help. It actually exacerbates the situation. So once we get the awareness of what is holding us back, now we, we get access to an entirely new existence. I love it, brother. Well, let's jump right in. We, we, yeah. As I walked through, uh, I saw this beautiful art piece that I've only seen online before. Uh -huh. Who's that by? The one in my office? From yeah. Cameron Gray? Cameron Gray. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. so... You were telling me that it kind of falls into this model that you're yeah. making. Is that something that's included in the book? I know it's a part of your work. Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay, and this eight-armed man. Yeah, you don't mind with two smaller arms. Yeah. yeah. So sort of basically these 10 constructs. And, you know, both in the interest of time, plus also the, you know, the fact that that's what my book's going to be about. We won't go through all of them, but I'd, I'm happy to share a couple of examples. So what they represent to me is like the metaphor I was giving earlier about the laptop human beings, as far as I'm concerned, come pre-installed with these 10 fundamental constraints. So one, for example, that everyone can relate to is that somehow I'm not enough as a human being. Now that can manifest, it has different arms to it. It could be as fundamental as I'm not good enough. For somebody else, I'm not young enough. Maybe I'm not old enough. I'm definitely not pretty enough. I'm not wealthy enough. I'm whatever not enough. And everybody at some point in their life will have had that experience. And that is not a truth but it's a piece of code 
that is a huge limitation to accessing what is truly available to you. So when I work with anyone or I speak to a group or a corporation, whatever seems to be this sort of um, these these issues on the surface, to me are simply revealing one of these or multiple versions of these 10 constructs. I love it. And once once you reveal that, it's like literally pulling the rug away. You know, there's my quote to people, I say, I don't solve problems, I dissolve them. And that right there is a massive distinction because what I'm appealing to is the fact that I'll also tell people, I can't give you something that you don't already have, but I can remove what's in the way of you realizing that. And that's priceless. Yeah, it's almost, I mean, it's in the the same thought process as weeding the garden rather than adding something else to your life. Yeah, Nothing's missing. Right. Let's just get rid of and clear the way. Yeah, it's Michelangelo's David, right? When he was asked, how did you create this incredible sculpture of this exquisite representation of man out of just a big lump of marble? His response was so eloquent. He said, well, I didn't. David was already in there. I just chipped away everything that wasn't David. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. So, I mean, I think at the end result here, there's many, many things that we're all shooting for in life, whether, and I'm, I don't mean just from abundance or wealth or things of that nature, but true peace, mm -hmm. joy, compassion, mm -hmm. love. Some of the big ones, the ones yeah. that are taught in the West and the East yeah. that all have parallels. Yeah. What stands in the way of peace? Um, this, you know, this construct that we're talking about, the idea of myself. So it might sound like a weird expression, but I say peace is, right? So it's not that I want to be peaceful. It's that who I think I am is the obstacles of the peace that already exists, right? So like the words you use, peace, freedom, love, these are all my quote unquote products. Not that they're mine, but that's what I'm revealing as what I would consider our inherent nature, right? Everybody has these qualities as their essence. And then on top of that, we develop this idea of ourselves that is somehow not that. It becomes a negation to our true essence. So I look at these two sort of main trunks of life. There's the I am and there's the I am not. And the I am not is the obstacle to experiencing the I am. But once we're established in the I am not, like as I said earlier, I'm not enough. Uh, I'm, I'm not loved. You know, this is very popular. These are, these are aspects of the persona. Once I'm in the I'm not something, then the behavioral adaptation to that is to try and garner that, to try and get that. So if I'm not enough, one of the behavioral adaptations to that is become a perfectionist, become a people pleaser. And then we get the symptoms of that, right? So now we get exhaustion, we get resignation, we get disappointment. Because if I'm being a people pleaser or I'm being a perfectionist, first of all, that can never actually be fulfilled upon because you're being driven by a mechanism that by design is a negation, right? It's a lie. If I'm saying I'm not enough, which itself isn't a truth, it's just a construct, then it doesn't matter what I do, I'm never going to fulfill on something that by design is an illusion. You know, I had a client in uh, New York who was blessed to have a lot of resources and she would like to do a bit of retail therapy. And I said to her one day, I said, there are not enough clothes in the world to reconcile the belief that you think you're not enough. Now, if you really get that, now you understand the nature of an addiction. See, the quote I use about addiction is, you can never get enough of something that almost works. <laughs> right? Now, if there, yeah. there's a lot of power in that because there's transitory relief. You know, somebody who does get some sort of external exogenous feeling of euphoria and success and they win, in whatever regards that might look like, that would mitigate for a minute their feeling of inadequacy. But then you need more of that because you haven't actually reconciled anything. You're still living within the construct of inadequacy. So my work is to actually transcend that. It is to reconcile by awareness, by realizing you know, the belief, and it's, it's actually deeper than a belief, the essence of who you think you are to be not enough is itself not a truth. And if something's not a truth, then you find freedom from it. And I'll give you an example. Not that long ago, people thought by looking at the horizon, that was the evidence to prove what? That the planet was flat. Now, if that's the way that the world occurred to us, that the planet was flat, what was the major fear for human beings? Falling off the edge of the earth. Right? Totally makes sense from that perspective until you get to where we are today and you realize how comical that is because you realize that, that was a lie. 
it's not actually a truth that the world is flat. And now all of a sudden, when we realize we're glued to this ball of mud by virtue of gravity, oh, that fear dissolved. Now, if we take that past experience of fear and bring in an expert, what would they have said? Well, you know, make sure they would have come up with devices, you know, like maybe here we've come up with this laser that will detect the edge of the horizon and it will make a beep when you get to a certain distance from it. You know, like there's all sorts of mechanisms, right, and solutions to avoid the fear. But all of that becomes moot when you realize, no, what you're scared of is based on a lie. So like in the world of I'm not enough, if people are trying to constantly perfect themselves, whatever that looks like, you know, from all the likes that you're trying to get on social media and you've got to look a certain way with filters and blah, blah, blah. Even going to the gym, which looks good, is a means of trying to make myself more attractive so that I can compensate for the deeper seated feeling of inadequacy. All of that suddenly becomes meaningless. To go back to your question about peace, there's no peace in that world. There just isn't. And again, one of my quotes, I say, you would never create peace in the world when people are at war within themselves. And I love people, that. It's right? like it's the 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 peace version of you can only love someone else as much as you can love yourself. Yes. Yeah, and that's where again all the best intentions in the world. I'm not in any way judging or knocking what people are trying to do. I'm just helping them see that their efforts are futile. They're not wrong, they're just futile because you're trying to overcome something that by virtue of its design, which is a linguistic construct, it's just in words. Like I cut you open, like where am I going to find you're not enough? It's not like that's your makeup, it's a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and when, when that hit me, it was just so comical. I'm like, holy shit, my whole life, I have been confined by words. Blah, blah, blah. And then it's like, ooh. That's why, it, like, hypnotists, it's so funny. Like, you know, when you see someone who's really good, I saw someone uh, recently uh, actually work with somebody and he had them put their hands together and they were under his powers of hypnotism. And he said, you know, when I snap my fingers or whatever, you can't separate your hands. <laughs> 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 and like, now, obviously that's not a truth, but because by virtue of the fact that their brain has listened to that language like it is a truth, then the body has to follow that code, right? So likewise, in uh, again, go back to the laptop because it's a very visual understanding uh, example for people to be able to, to get, which is if you open up Microsoft Word, you don't get upset by the fact that you can't Photoshop your photos because you know that's not what the program does. Yes. Conversely, you don't go to iPhoto and go, holy shit, why is this not working out these, these complicated mathematical formulas that I would normally do in Excel? So once we understand the programming that we're in and how it's designed, then we can recognize, well, no wonder I have an unfulfilling relationship. No wonder I'm not getting paid what I think I'm worth. No wonder I keep falling back into the habit of gaining weight because the programming that I'm living in is a direct extension towards those external circumstances repeating themselves. And that's why people, you know, I have so much compassion because people end up in this state of dis-ease, which then manifests physically at some point, and they're doing everything they can to try and overcome that in the solution-based world, the strategy-based world, without actually getting deep enough into the programming of who they think they are to realize, holy shit, there's absolutely nothing wrong with me other than what I've been saying. I love it. Well, if we if we can somehow get past the monkey mind mm -hmm. or start to dive deeper into the self and raise our awareness, what are some of the practices that you've employed? Obviously you spoke about these great teachers from the East. Mm -hmm. um, is it meditation? Is it breath work? Like what are the ways that you've used to still your mind to open up that channel of intuition where you can really start to sort and see what's going on inside? I think, you know, I mean, it might seem like a, a, uh, unsatisfying response but it's like just live life you know it's one of my favorite comments or distinctions i've shared that a lot of people have talked about which is life will present you with people and circumstances to reveal where you're not free so you will always basically the treasure lies where are you getting triggered mm. and if you're not living life you're not getting triggered yeah, that's something I I, I kind of understand through breathwork practices and meditation and all these things that if I couldn't actually quiet my mind in a fight, yeah, then none of that shit was working anyways. Right. Right. And of course I didn't master that in fighting, but it's it's been a path that I've continued to unfold with. 
Yeah. And I think about that in everyday life now. Like, where is the fight in everyday life? Well, it's when I feel yeah. triggered. It's when I get upset and angered by external circumstance. Yeah, amazing. That's uh, where I'm vulnerable. Yes. Well, and that's a beautiful word but that I speak to. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So unpack that. Yeah. Because I'm not vulnerable anywhere. But. No, exactly. exactly. But that's a distinction, right? And so... Most people think of vulnerability as a weakness, and I think it's quite the antithesis. I think it's a massive strength, if you're willing to embrace it, right? So again, I talk in quotes because that's how I write my book, but I say, as soon as you're okay being vulnerable, you're no longer vulnerable. Now, if you really get that, the guy who doesn't want to be vulnerable is vulnerable because he's hiding something or she's hiding something, right? There's something that we feel about ourselves that not, we're not willing to share. So now we're actually hiding that which is to ourselves occurs as a, a flaw, an imperfection, which then means energetically we haven't embraced ourselves. If we haven't fully embraced ourselves and we've, we, we're a, we are vulnerable to being discovered in a way that we don't want to be discovered. But the person who's like, you know, saying blah, blah, blah about themselves, like, yeah, I have this and this and I have this, like, like it's a matter of fact, part of just being human, like, I'm not perfect, but if they're okay with that, even though what they're sharing might seem socially, you know, like viewed as a weakness, but if they're okay with it, then they're no longer vulnerable, right? So there's a, there's a sort of a, a misnomer, I think, about vulnerability being vulnerable. And it's like, no, it's actually a strength. It's the degree to which you're basically saying, I love all aspects of myself. So, so to go back to your question, when we can even see those vulnerabilities that we don't want to express, that is how we start to access freedom. That is the trigger, the external trigger. Okay, why am I feeling discomforting experiences in this particular circumstance? What is it that it's revealing about the way I view myself? Like the concern of what they might think about me, the concern of whether I'm going to fail, the concern of whatever it is that I feel is going to happen if I say what I want to say. Right? And these are legitimate concerns, again, for which I have nothing but love and compassion, but the, the, they are the access to freedom. Because if you don't express that, then now, not only did you not get to see what's on the other side of it as an outcome, right? Let's like just say, it's a simple everyday example. There's a guy or a girl in a bar, at a restaurant, at a cafe, and they see someone of the opposite sex, same sex that they're drawn to, and they want to go and say hi whether it be to try and get a number or to just engage in a conversation. But we've all been there. I know I was there, you know, where there's a intrepidation, right? There's the fear of rejection. What if I look bad? What if they don't want to engage? What if they say no? And that fear exists inside of us before we've even taken action. But the growth beyond it is, first of all, to recognize it and then take action. Regardless of the outcome, that is where we actually grow, to me, spiritually, because we're facing some form of constraint, some form of self-inadequacy, yet we are going against the grain of it versus being suppressed and constrained by it. And so that gives us a little bit of a glimpse of what it means to be a, a more powerful version of ourselves, regardless of what happens. You know, best case scenario, you grow and you get their number. You know? <laughs> yeah, that is best case. <laughs> yeah. Well, and they might be psychos, in which case it's like, true. I wish I'd freaking shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I think these 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 tools are all leading us to be, I mean, I, I absolutely love that. I actually got hung up on that. Um, the idea of being in the world, mm -hmm. right? Like we can get so caught up with stillness and practicing our escape or creating spaciousness in our lives. And yeah. that can go to the extreme end of, I'm going to go meditate in the mountains for 30 years yes. and not be a part of the world. And as I mentioned with the, the fight analogy, why does it even matter then if right. I can't live among the people and enjoy life and, yeah. and put it into practice? Yeah, yeah. A lot of this boils down to acceptance. Yeah. It, it boils down to whatever happens, I'm okay with. Yeah. Yeah. And meditation to go back, you know, and breath work, these are beautiful tools, don't get me wrong. But ex exquisitely put, like if you just stay in your own little apartment and just meditate all day trying to perfect yourself, you're not engaging in the world. And so we live by virtue of relativity, you know, relationships in the sort of everyday understanding of them, like intimate, are the form by which we get to know who we are. Right? So relativity, how I relate to my environment and to other people is the catalyst for my own self-growth and awareness. So if I'm not relating to anything, then I sort of become oblivious because I, I, I don't know if I'm smart, fast, wealthy, you know, whatever it is, because I've got nothing to compare against. 
So, rel- you know, relationships to me are such a beautiful catalyst for growth, which is why they're usually the number one topic of conversation that everybody has in terms of their, you know, their their woes. It's like, you know, I'm struggling with this and it's usually some form of relationship. It doesn't have to be intimate or romantic. It could be with my family. It could be with my boss or people at work. With but- money. Yeah. With my body. Yeah. yeah. But it's how I relate to something that is how we get to reveal where we're not, as you said, okay with something. And it's one of my favorite questions for myself is, I say, can I be with this? Whatever it is, whatever just transpired, whatever news I heard, can I be with it? Meaning, can I sit with it? Can I be fully engaged with it and not be upset, not be thrown off? not be angry, not be in conflict, not create resistance. Acceptance to me is the antithesis of resistance. And most people are in a constant state of resistance. Like, well, they shouldn't have done that. Everyday simple comment, but they are in a state of resistance about whatever that person did. And it can be totally trivial, but they got upset by that. Or, well, I should be somewhere else in my life by now. Self-judgment. But are you? No. So now, not only are you not where you're supposed to be in your mind, but now you're creating dis-ease in your body. <laughs> <laughs> that's super inspiring. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but everyone does it every day. So that's where I want people to have a lot more like sort of grace and ease about themselves, to realize everyone's doing the best they can within the realm of awareness that there's available to them. Now, of course, we want to enhance awareness. And this is why hopefully beautiful podcasts like you do. And however I can contribute through whatever I'm sharing, people go, oh, wow, I didn't realize that I've spent 30 years of my life living within this construct that I thought that I was a failure. Like things happened and maybe you didn't win whatever you're doing, but that doesn't mean you're a failure. Failure could be seen as maybe an event, but it's not a person, right? So, and I wouldn't even say the event was a failure. It's just like whatever happened, you know, you didn't win. You know, and then W's and L's is a big part of my life with athletes, you know, and then there's such a duality now. Oh, we win or we lose. And I'm like, I don't even like that. I'm like, you win or you learn. That's a much better way as far as I'm concerned, because, okay, you can, can, you can can categorize it as you lost, but that's only going to appeal to the ego that feels inadequate. And now you've got more evidence to feel sorry for yourself. And that just doesn't get anyone anywhere. It's a beautiful thing to flip that on its head, and it seems cliche, like, oh, you're almost making an excuse if you're not winning. You just treat it like a lesson, but in and this goes well outside of sport. Mm-hmm. In anything you would consider a loss, mm-hmm. if you learn from, it's never a loss. It's always a gain. It's always yeah. a net positive. And go back to where we started with the apparent loss of my parents, which, you know, I'm glad this came up because I wanted to speak to it, is when I said that I was in the narrative and the story of loss, is that I thought that's what actually happened. But it wasn't. I wasn't at the mall and couldn't find my parents. That might have been a more accurate description of loss. They died. And that might seem like a very callous way of talking about my own folks, but that's that's reality. And if and if there's one thing that I love people to dis, dis establish is have an intimate relationship with reality versus your thoughts about reality. Because then I'm in life versus in my story about it. So my parents passed. That's what happened. And as a human being who was loved by them and who loved them, I had my grief, I had my sadness, I missed them. These are all very natural. But if I lost something, now I have the grief, the sadness, and the missing, and there's something inadequate and missing about me now. So not something only- Something taken from you. Yeah. And so now I'm compromised. It's not sufficient that I went through a very difficult time in my life. I've got that combined with now the perpetual fear of that happening again if I live in a story of loss. And I'm not saying that whatever people think they lost is to be, you know, in any way trivialized. It can be very difficult. But please don't use that as evidence to think that now you're always looking out for the next thing that you're going to lose. Because first of all, it's the nature of life. And I would recontextualize it. It's not that we lost anything. It's just that form changes. Form's in constant flux. We've been sitting on my couch for 30 minutes. We have both lost millions of cells. Neither of us seem to be freaking out about it. (laughs) Right? Because new ones are being born. That is right there, biological evidence that nothing is constant. Everything is in flux. And that could mean that the coming and going of a physical form. It might be your cat that you're very close to. And that can be a very heartbreaking experience. You didn't lose the cat. The cat passed. And I would actually recontextualize it to say, I have nothing but gratitude for the love that that cat helped inspire in me. 
like I had that for my parents. I am now so grateful for the fact that I had a father who pretty much every day in some form or another, whether it be words or actions, let me know that he loved me. Now, I had him for 17 years. And many people are like, oh, dude, that's so rough. I'm like, well, is it? Or did I have a father who, by example and action, gave me the experience of love that many people who have a father for 70 years never experience? So is it based in time or quality of relationship? So again, the point is there's no loss as far as I'm concerned. There's the experience of loss, but it's not an actual loss. It's the transition of form. And if we can look at it that way, that this world that we exist in, this three-dimensional experience, is in constant flux, it also inspires a lot of freedom to not be attached, but to let go. I actually wrote a post recently that um, a lot of people commented on, and I kind of just did a quick commentary on it. Like, I hadn't given it too much thought, and I just put a nice picture and said balance. And, And I love the word because in Ayurveda, which is part of my work, they recognize balance is a dynamic state. It's not a static state. And I said, you know, oftentimes when we feel imbalanced in life, you know, if you are literally imbalanced, you want to go to hold on to something. And so the same is true emotionally. And I said, actually, as soon as you hold on to something, you get stuck. And so actually true balance is to be found in your ability to let go. I love that. And that was the response. It was amazing. It was so sweet. I mean, I've been inundated recently in a in a very humbling and flattering way with different podcasts that I've been on with, you know, at one level, very, very moving situations that people have gone through. Um, you know, out of respect to some of these private messages I'm getting in DMs, I won't cite them, but, you know, people who are walking into situations that are very traumatic. Um but that somehow through the words that I shared, they got relief or they saw a glimpse of possibility for themselves. So um, this is just a little post on Instagram, but it's, it is very touching to see how just a subtle reframe in words can give people an immense amount of liberation. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. people are suffering, you know? It's, uh, it's sort of, in Buddhism, they talk about it, right? The Four Noble Truths. I think, I think the first one is life is suffering. Like, get used to it. <laughs> And so um, I think there's something so um, gratifying for me in the way that I'm able to, in whatever way is available to someone, help them recontextualize their view of themselves, consequently their view of life that helps to dissolve suffering. Like that to me is true success. Because we all know the person who's a multi-gazillionaire Uh, or is super famous or has massive platform on social media, but is struggling with something, right? That's not, that's not where the, the ultimate goal of success is to be found, you know, and Jim Carrey, I think speaks to this quite nicely. He said, you know, I hope you become famous and make millions of dollars. So you realize that's not where you're going to find happiness. (laughs) Uh, So true peace to me is, um, is when we get to that place where we are quote, unquote, okay with everything. Total acceptance. Full acceptance. And because I think a lot of people misunderstand that almost like a little sense of resignation or apathy, like, okay, well, whatever. You know, and that's not what we're saying here. It's like, I am, you know, again, I like using these little distinctions. I say, I have a very intimate relationship with reality. Like I'm in harmony with the way that things are. And I'm fully committed to the things that I want to create. Right. So even that balance that I was talking about earlier, I'm I'm allowing things to be the way they are, which really is sort of kind of an obnoxious thing to say anyway, because who the hell am I to say I allow things to be the way they are? <laughs> it's like they are the way they are, you know. Very nice of me, Peter, to allow the universe to be the way it is. <laughs> Son, you can rise now. <laughs> right. Whenever you're ready. Um, so really it's just, you know, I'm in harmony with by virtue of the fact that I'm not resisting, I'm allowing things to be the way they are from my experience, which gives me freedom. And then I can step into a world of creativity, which is I'm exploring what is available to me, both through my own expression, but also on planet Earth, versus most people have got the sort of the antithesis to that happening, which is they are in resistance to life. They don't want it to be that way, whether it's their body, their relationship, their bank account. And now they're in a reactive state of mind. And a reactive state of mind, if we get into the physiology, is based in a sympathetic response, which is fight, flight, or freeze. And that's going to give rise to those emotions a lot of people have, which is anger, violence, frustration, resignation, 
uh, guilt, shame, or, or depression and withdrawal, right? That's the sort of the flight. You know, when you're in a flight state of mind, you're withdrawing from life. You don't want to deal with it. Shutting down, yeah. Yeah, and that is all based on resistance to what is. So, I mean, you touched on this just recently with the difference between, you know, the, the idea that total acceptance would mean I don't give a shit what happens in life and I'm going to let go of all my goals. Mm-hmm. You know, when we said intention and then we have to surrender to what is or ex- at the very least accept what is, Yeah. what does that balancing act look like? It's a great question. It's something I've actually been working on recently because, you know, I, I don't want people to lose ambition. Right? I work with some of the highest performers in the world who are incredibly driven. But as I was just saying, I make the distinction between a desire that is based in a resistant energy versus a desire that is based in an explorative or creative energy. So I want is, is a future-based pro, uh, proposition. Right, Wanting as an energy means that I don't have. Otherwise, I wouldn't want it. So I'm already creating time psychologically, which can create stress. Now, if that wanting is based in a reaction to what I don't want, which is what most desires come from, when people say I want to get in shape, it's not, it's not clean. It's usually I want to get in shape because the view of myself is I'm not, right? It goes back to those two trunks. I am or I'm not. When people are basing their choices on something they're not as the precursor to their desires and their actions... My experience of working with thousands of people over two or three decades is it's always going to end up in some sort of disappointment because the impetus for your choice to move forward is by something you don't want, right? And my quote again, I say, you'll never create the life you want by trying to fix the life you don't want. Now, again, if you get that, that speaks to what I just shared, right? So, Now, what we want to look at, okay, awesome that you've got all these goals, aspirations, and dreams, but are they coming from a place of true creativity, true desire that is creative in its quality, or is it something that you are subtly judging about yourself, or maybe not even subtly judging about yourself, that you're trying to fix, which may garner some results. Look, I mean, people go to the gym with pissed off attitudes, and they're like, I've had enough of this, and they do get results. But my, my, I would propose that that's not going to last, right? They, they it's will, not sustainable. They will come back. I mean, look at The Biggest Loser. I got to meet with the producers, you know, over maybe some potential TV stuff at one point because they recognized that 90 plus percent of the people that were losing half of themselves, 400 pounds to 200 pounds or something dramatic, which is visually very satisfying for people to watch were ending up back where they started three, four, five years from there because they hadn't actually addressed the deep subconscious pans that we touched on that were the precursor to the poor habits or the the shitty food that they were putting into their system because they didn't have self-worth. So until all of that gets addressed, most people's desires, most people's actions, most people's behaviors are being driven by the, the, the opposition to something. And, and that's the subtle distinction to answer your question is yeah. I want people to tap into a more childlike, explorative desire. Like kids aren't exploring every aspect of their house and life when they go out there and touching and licking and because there's something wrong. They're naturally curious. It's like, wow, this is cool. You know, and as parents, when I work with parents, and I think most parents can attest to this, there's a joy about having a kid, not so much just because, one, you wake up to the fact that you are actually a loving person, not resigned in your 30s and saying, what the fuck's this all about? You know, it's like, oh, I finally have something to care about that yeah. isn't just about me. But they get to vicariously look at life again through the kid's eyes. And it's like, wow, yeah, I forgot how excited I was the first time I went on a merry-go-round, you know? And so kids have this natural desire to explore that is not being driven by a belief of inadequacy. Whereas I think most humans get to that point of resignation, they develop these calloused ideas of themselves that are in, I'm not enough, I'm not safe, whatever it is. And now they're looking for something external again to try and compensate for that. And it's a subtle distinction, but it's very powerful. Am I, am I seeking for relief from a world of suffering that I'm in? Or am I exploring this incredible dimension of planet Earth to just see what's available? Mm. How do people, I don't want to, I'm not sure how to word this. How do people break routine 
to get into that because it seems like in terms of the childlike curiosity, it seems to me that as we age, for whatever reason, if it's setting up protective mechanisms or maybe this is the 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 mental game we've sustained and told ourselves for a certain point of time that locks us into these certain things where we don't want to try new things. We forget how to play. It, yeah. it blows my fucking mind how many people I talk to about play that literally will ask me and my wife, how do you guys play? Right. And like play, Aaron Alexander said it last night. It's as simple as cracking a joke with right. the bartender. Yeah, it's yeah, as yeah. simple as being goofy. It's the it's the opposition of yeah. seriousness. Yeah, yeah, and that's why I use so much humor with my work, and which is a part of that tough love. You know, like that might not sound like humor, but invariably it will lead to some sort of comic relief because when you really get authentic with someone and in their face, there is relief because it's like you're actually telling the truth. Like I know, like with one of my show jumpers, I, I spoke to about her recently on a podcast. I said, I love this girl. Like she's one of my favorite human beings on the planet. But I just flat out said to her, you're just being so fucking sloppy. And you're telling me you want to go to the Olympics? Like who are you trying to kid? Like start acting like an Olympian. Like are you going to just show up in July and hope it goes well? <laughs> <laughs> Right. And so that to me, like, and then she could have some humor about it. Yes, it hurts. And she's like, you're right. And then like, and then it's like the subtext is I love you, which is why I'm being straight with you. And now we can get into playing the game of in this, in her case, being an Olympian. But uh, I think where people struggle is that everybody's um, too scared to just tell the truth. Again, I say, you know, what interests me is the truth, however uncomfortable it makes you feel. Lying is boring. Everybody does that. So accessing play is being able to come back to what we were saying about being vulnerable, which isn't being vulnerable, and just tell the truth. Because once you tell the truth, there is this feeling of relief. Relief is lightness. Lightness is a precursor to play. People who are struggling with depression have a heavy energy about them. There's nothing playful about that state of mind. And so to constantly have the courage to tell the truth, I'm not saying it's honest, uh, so I'm not saying it's easy, but to be honest is the way that you're at least going to access that sense of freedom, which then is the cascade into some intimacy, not necessarily physical, but I get to connect with someone because I actually told them how I feel, which then usually does encourage a sense of playfulness versus the pretense that most people have. Listen, in LA, you go to some fancy event and people are wearing their like freaking garments that are God knows how much, you know, because it's got some name on it that it apparently warrants charging a thousand bucks versus 20 at Target. You know, it's like, and in that room with all of this wealth and this well-to-do behavior, you inject a three-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> who starts just running around and pulling on people's skirts and, you know, just knocking shit over and trying food and trying to reach something on the... Like, there's a freedom there that all of a sudden injects playfulness into the room because everybody can just lighten up because the kid isn't so self-conscious that he's trying to have the airs and graces about how he's occurring to everybody. And so I think that's where if people could just lighten up, get over yourself. You know, I uh, again, one of the things I share, I say, you know, please never become perfect. You'll have no one to relate to. <laughs> so if, if that's something that people can just like embody a little bit and go, you know what? Everybody gets these experiences of feeling like a loser. Everybody sometimes feels like, what's the point? You know, everybody feels like they're not loved and appreciated at times. And it's okay. It's just embody that. In, in, in meaning integrate it. It's part of our humanity. And, and when we're trying not to allow our humanity to be part of us, we miss the point, right? Now you're, you're actually human trying not to show your humanity. <laughs> How's that working out for you? Yeah. You know? So that's where play comes in. That's where don't take yourself so freaking serious. This is why we love comics and going to, you know, comedies or whether it's a film or a live show it's like people point out the most ridiculous things that we all do as humans that is a form of self-protection why because we're so worried about our appearance and why are we worried about appearance because primarily as human beings we want to belong to the tribe 
We don't want to get kicked out. You get kicked out of the gang, what happens? You die because you're out in the wilderness. That's how primal it is. Now, it's not actually going to happen in this day and age. <laughs> yeah. But the codes, the, the circuits of our nervous system are still very active. Yeah, it's deeply embedded. I mean, yeah, the... it's primal. It's a primal desire to survive. Who has time to play? I'm trying to make sure that I make it so that one day I can actually relax and play. <laughs> so what, what from your understanding now when you're working with clients can you give in terms of people who get caught back in a loop, people who get caught back because it's not like you got your cell phone available and they're just going to hit you up like, hey, this just happened. Right. What is the reset button that you allow? Is I thought it we were going to your... announce cell phones and people could just... <laughs> <laughs> right here, we'll give it away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's skip the DMs. We know, we know your DM is, is pretty <laughs> loaded, loaded right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, listen, I, I think there's 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 a multitude of things that people can have access to today. I think... Anything that you can do energetically that at least is a intention towards your own self-growth, and whatever that might look like, it might mean you go and join your local community. It might mean that you go to your local church, like community meaning in terms of like some some sports team. Like it could be that you go to a yoga class. You may, you might try a workshop for a day or a weekend. Something that is going to give you access to information that can trigger an insight. Because I think, again, we're designed to think that we're separate. And as long as we think we're separate, there's this sort of onus that we feel we have to figure it out all by ourselves. And if there's one thing I've learned from some of the very, very successful people that I help around the world, is they're the first to actually seek guidance. And, and there's something really powerful in that, like, you know, whether we call it delegation in a corporate setting, it's being able to be contributed to being open to that. And it's a bit of a double-edged sword because we're designed to oftentimes not want to be an inconvenience to people, right? As kids, oftentimes we're sort of shunned a little bit. Like, you know, we want to be seen, not heard. And we've grown up in an environment where we don't want to sort of upset anyone for fear of sometimes what could be like a really, you know, scary situation someone gets pulled into. So we become very polite as humans. And so we try to figure things out. And I think to help break these loops, to help break these cycles, talk to somebody, you know, share. And again, we don't want to just talk to everybody, like somebody who you trust, who you know does love you. Because the old adage of, you know, a problem shared is a problem halved. Like if you can actually have the courage to talk about whatever you're dealing with, however embarrassing it might seem, you will be amazed at how oftentimes what you're sharing, that person either is feeling already, has felt, or will at some point feel because they're human. So instead of a strategy, I think just having that, that awareness that talking to people, opening up about what you're dealing with in a safe environment with somebody, as I said, that you trust, to just be able to even voice what's going on in your head can create a bit of separation from it. Um, and that's, that's the first step as far as I'm concerned is always getting awareness by whatever method you have to get it. Reading. The podcasts these days are so popular. You know, It's just been incredible, as I said for me. And so gratifying, so humbling. Having done you know, a good half a dozen podcasts or so recently, like just the inundation of appreciation, love, gratitude, thanks. So it doesn't have to be me, but there's a lot of guys out there and girls who have great things to say. Instagram, what an amazing platform. Yes, for the girl who has to show you again her, her glutes <laughs> in a very tiny piece of fabric for the thousandth time, that works for some people. Or maybe you could find an account that has got some beautiful quotes or some inspiration. Sad gurus on Instagram. There you go. They're, yeah, Muji's right. on Instagram. Yeah. So, so I just I invite people to explore who you are. Right. We're taught a lot about math and geography and history, and we can learn these sort of external, very informationally dense subjects. But I'm fascinated with learning about who we are, not outer space, which we're sort of conquering. What about inner space? Like, what is it that I say about myself that makes me feel down? You know, is it true that I really am not loved, or is that just how I feel? 
And where can I find the evidence that maybe instigated that? You know, just because my mom or my dad said blah, 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 that hurt when I was a kid. But now as a 20-year-old, a 30-year-old, a 40-year-old, is it true that I can't find a loving, passionate relationship with someone who adores me because I didn't experience that as a kid? It's not true. It might feel like that's your destiny. And as I tell people again, past hurt informs future fear. Right? So wherever we've had disappointment, it tends to, by virtue of the brain wanting to predict and protect us all the time, sort of perennially repeat those patterns. But that's the work. That to me is the real game. It's not about amassing more money. It's not about amassing more followers. It's not about looking fantastic. These are all wonderful things to have. But if you haven't overcome the constraints internally in the way that you view yourself as somehow inferior or inadequate or insecure, then I don't care what trappings you've got externally, you're still going to be dealing with some sense of interior disappointment, disease, suffering. Um, and that to me isn't success. So, Most definitely. Yeah. Well, I think I've got, I think we've got time for one, one more question I want to sure. ask you. Sure. Sure. Um, You've mentioned before, you've talked about the awakening process mm -hmm. and why we're here. To rem and I think uh, Paul Selig, many, many, many people have spoken about this, but some of the things that have resonated with me is to remember who we are, yeah. to remember what we are, where we came from, yeah. and to know where we return to. Yeah. What, is, what are your thoughts from the spiritual sense on the purpose and point of life? Is it too experienced? I mean, there's been said, for Alan Watts, get lost, man. Like very yeah. beautiful ways of saying, let's have this experience. But there's no doubt there are ways we can construct our life in a way to where we can maximize bliss, peace, love, joy. And there are other ways where we can experience hell every single day we're here. Yeah. And that's one of my favorite quotes by uh, John Milton, British author. He said, the mind is a place within itself and can make heaven of hell or hell of heaven, right? So, uh, and again, even Shakespeare said, nothing is either good nor bad, only thinking makes it so. So to answer your question about the purpose, in my humble opinion, the whole, this whole dimension that we're here for is to break free. And what are we breaking free from? The constraints and the shackles of our own subconscious thinking. That's it. Now, sounds simple. It's not. It's the greatest game available. It, to me, it's like the cosmic Houdini, right? We arrived spiritual beings shackled by these beliefs of inadequacy. And now the game is who can break free? And that's why I encourage people, as I said earlier, to your response to one of your questions, live life. Like find places where you are discomforted. Like, and again, not like in some sort of masochistic way that you want to re keep repeating. <laughs> BDSM, <laughs> get your ass beat with a dildo. Some people are into that. <laughs> That's a whole nother, yeah, <clears throat> conversation. But find areas where fear does come to the surface. Look at where are you concerned about things because that is, as I said, the, the treasure that will reveal what is it deep down that you're saying you're not okay with. Where have you not found complete peace with some arena of your life? And I got this beautiful, um, talk about DMs. This woman left another voice message in Instagram. And she was from Europe somewhere, had a very strong accent, but it was very sweet. She said, Pizza, I'm not going to try and repeat the accent. <laughs> <laughs> After 51 years of seeking, where I thought there was something wrong with me, and there was something wrong with my parents, and there was something wrong with, my, with the universe, I realized nothing is wrong. Everything is just the way it is. And for the first time in my life, I have discovered peace. And I thank you. And she said, so, 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 so much. So that, to me, is a winner. I don't know if she's got $1 in the bank account or she's in debt or whatever. But she, her voice, the resonance of her voice was the essence of complete acceptance. And that to me is the game. That is the purpose is can I in this dimension find complete peace regardless of circumstance? And I'm not condoning certain circumstances, right? Like some people do have truly difficult situations they're in. 
but whilst I maintain proactivity to improving my life, which I'm very in, you know, committed to as well, can I simultaneously be in harmony with and not in resistance with? Can I accept everything the way it is? Because as soon as I allow, and again, it may seem audacious, it's not for us to allow, but as soon as I can accept that everything is the way it is right now, and I'm okay with that, I'm free. And again, as I say, life is the way it is, but only always. <laughs> Man, I absolutely love it. Thank you so much for having me to your home, and thank you for coming on the podcast, brother. Dude, you're, you're, you're such a sweet guy. I'm so glad that Aaron introduced this, and it's my pleasure to be here, and I feel very uh, privileged to be able to, through guys like you, hopefully touch somebody's heart, help them find a bit of peace and freedom for themselves, because... You know, there's a lot of people out there struggling. And um, if there's anything that I can do and you can do to make a difference, I think it's one of the greatest forms of fulfillment we can have as humans is to know that somehow I nudge the needle in the direction of freedom and joy for somebody. Beautiful. Where can people find you online? Um, my website, uh, petercrone.com. Um, and actually, if people want to sign up right now, well, depending on when this airs, but we actually have my first offering coming out, which is pretty exciting, which is an online course. So if people want to put in their email, at least they'll get notified if that's something they're interested in. Uh, and then Instagram, uh, Peter Crone Official. Uh, joined the Dizzy Heights of that about a year or so ago. And it's, it's fun, you know, just, I mean, I get these beautiful DMs that I would never have gotten if I hadn't joined. So Amazing, brother. Thank yeah. you so much. Dude, Thank a you. joy to be with you. Much love to you and everybody listening. Yeah.